Today, in the worship service, we're going to be talking about Romans chapter 5, that great, great ancient text that has lasted lo these many centuries and has informed everything about our society. And what does it have to say about endurance and character and hope? And of course, God's grace and forgiveness. Surely, certainly, the way we understand God's grace in our lives will inform decisively our ability to forgive. And what is more needed in our society now than the ability to ask forgiveness and offer forgiveness? Well, what do you say? Let's walk through these doors and let's worship God. Blessed good morning to you one and all and welcome to Drexel Hill United Methodist Church this second Sunday after Pentecost. Let's begin now our worship by joining together in the collect included in your bulletin. Let us pray. Generous God, you gather your people and lavish your gifts upon us day by day. Grant that each experience of your pardon may enlarge our own love until it meets the measure of your extravagant forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we move now to our service of confession, I say to you, we know ourselves to be a broken people, separated from ourselves, others, and the Lord of life. Let us therefore confess our brokenness together. Almighty God, we confess that we are often swept up in the tide of our generation. We have failed in our calling to be a holy people a people set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in compassion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambitions than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glory without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and lives for you. Forgive us 
revive us and reshape us in your image. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us, in one voice, receive our pardon, saying, Thanks be to God. My name is Alyssa Hanrahan, and the reading for today is Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah. He said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And the set time I will return to you in the due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were yet weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps... For a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves God's love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us.
Can I share a confidence with you? Would that be all right? Barbara and I disagree about the standard to which a room should be painted. Now, I know that the ceiling color can come onto the wall, maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch. If you get the wall color on the ceiling, it draws attention to itself. But a sixteenth, an eighth of an inch of ceiling on the top of the wall, that doesn't call its attention. That doesn't call attention to itself. Barbara lives under the delusion that it's possible to paint exactly to the corner. Exactly. We disagree on this important topic. Fortunately, by grace or good humor, the providence of God, Barbara and I have managed to live together happily for getting to be about a quarter of a century now. We've managed to live together even though we're looking at the same walls. I'm less impressed with our larger culture, though. We can't seem to agree on anything. Apparently, we can't even agree on how to address COVID-19. We can't agree on whether racism exists or whether sick people should be cared for or whether they should just be told to crawl under a rock and die. Our politics is not at its best at the moment. It is a minor miracle when anything is accomplished for the common good in Washington or Harrisburg, even when lives are in the balance. We are at an inflection point. One of our generals has told us so. Strangely, now our generals have to serve purposes they were never built for because we have no statesmen and our priests uh, have frittered off to some place and our sages, our sages don't exist and the only thing we have to listen to is polemicists. All have been found wanting. It is clear that we have failed to push through the challenges facing us by means of tinkering around the edges. And that's why the general suggested we are at an inflection point. Something dramatic is changing in our society and its conclusion is not especially clear to me. But there is one thing that is utterly crystal clear. There is one thing that offers profound clarity following the cultural shear that appears to be taking place. We need forgiveness more than that. We will need grace. There is no way we can come through such division as we're experiencing without seeking and offering one another forgiveness. Now, I know we can do this among our circle of friends. I know we can manage it often enough in our families. We can do it in our communities pretty well. But on the things that divide us, that are coming to the sheer point that are coming to the inflection, we do utterly and profoundly need to be prepared to forgive. Grace and forgiveness belong in the same stable. They're, they're of a breed. Um, there's differences, but there's some relationship between grace and forgiveness.
grace can be abstract. I mean, what are we asking God for? Why are we asking God for it? Grace, it can be abstract. Forgiveness is concrete. I know that I did something that upset that person. I, I know that. Forgiveness can be concrete. Grace denotes a status before God. We are in a state of grace before God. Forgiveness is a relationship with God. Forgiveness is a relationship with one another. But grace, rather than forgiveness, is, for whatever reason, Paul's characteristic term in the lesson that we just read. And the kind of justifying grace that Paul is talking about is hardly more than the prerequisite, the presupposition of that communion with our neighbors and with God. That sharing with and in God, which is the Christian life itself. But if we've been rehearsing anything in our lives as people of faith, it is asking forgiveness of one another and offering forgiveness to one another. This, this is the stock and the tray of being faithful. We're never going to accomplish anything worth risking without risking needing forgiveness. And we're never going to allow anyone to accomplish anything unless we're prepared to offer forgiveness. Our larger world now, our larger community, has demonstrated utterly its incompetence with forgiveness. And we have something to offer. The only question is, when we come to that sheer point, when we come to that inflection, are we able, when all of a sudden it becomes blitheringly obvious that we're going one way and not another, are we able Christian charity to bring the others along. I think that is the one powerful and profound question for people of faith. Are we at all competent and at doing what should be our core competence? Offering and receiving Forgiveness from one another. Asking, offering, receiving. Something for us to contemplate as we go through this next stretch in our lives. Do you have something to offer? Does the community of faith have something to offer? Why, yes, it does. Are you ready? Are you ready to offer it to the world? Thanks be to God. Amen. As we move now to our sending forth, I say to you, to live is to risk and care. We are ready to live for all human time. Life is mission. We choose to be sent. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of two
Now this service is ended, but our lives in Jesus Christ go on and on. Take the message of forgiveness. Take the message of God's grace to everyone you meet in your house, in your neighborhood, in the world, and take this benediction with you. God, the creator, God, the redeemer, God, the sustainer, be with you now and remain with you evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.